This is a HeadGum Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. I am Jeff Rubin, and today I am here on the Skype phone with Danny O'Brien, and I am glad he's here because he's an online free speech activist who serves as the international director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Danny, welcome to the show. Hey Jeff, good to be here. Uh, first of all, got to start with what is the Electronic Found? God, it's hard to say. What is the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation, which I should probably just start calling the EFF? Yes, I think it's probably easier to say that. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation has, has, as they say, a storied history. We started in 1990, which I think was before many people knew what the Internet was. But it was a bunch of, uh, I think the phrase is civil libertarians, uh, who uh, started the organization because they recognized that um, the Internet and technology in general was going to transform how people were governed, how people were going to express themselves, what they were going to be able to do, and what they could be stopped from doing. And uh, it was started essentially to kind of protect people's rights and protect any new rights they developed. Were the concerns in 1990 like the concerns today? I'm trying to just imagine what the internet meant and what it was like in 1990. A lot of lot of fighting for the rights of bulletin board users. Actually, that's that that that's literally true. Um, so our founders were um, uh, John Gilmore who uh, was one of the early sort of internet millionaires. Um, John Perry Barlow, who is a, uh, a, is a lyricist for the Grateful Dead. Um, Mitch Kapoor, who invented um, the most popular version of sort of spreadsheets. So another kind of early pioneer. Um, so f- folks like that. And um, so they were already fairly far seeing in what they saw the effects. And, and, and it was really always about kind of free speech and privacy. Um, a lot of it actually, though, was to do with fear mongering. One of our first cases was um, uh, defending a bunch of uh, uh, hackers who had um, were uh, um, basically chatting on a bulletin board system, and uh, uh, the Secret Service um, got it into their heads that they were trying to bring da- down the uh, 911 system, the emergency phone system. And they weren't doing anything of the sort. They were actually just talking about publicly available information. But, you know, then as now, people were very happy to fearmonger the sort of power of, of the Internet and the power of people who were using the technology. So you guys are fighting for... Uh, kind of the digital versions of our of our civil liberties, and is this a glo- you're the international director, so it is a global organization. This is not just an American thing. Yeah, it's. I mean, it started out as American thing. I mean, essentially, at heart, what we are is a is kind of a a, a bunch of lawyers wrapped um, round by a bunch of technologists with a sort of crunchy layer of the outside of activists. But we're a, we're a law firm, and we um, take cases in the United States. But the internet's global, and so there's always something going on. And also for many, many years, less true now, but for many years, um, one of the problems was that the U.S. would develop some terrible idea in legislation um, to control the internet and then try and export it to the rest of the world. So a lot of what we do is kind of American-based, but we we try and run interference on those um, uh, those expansions of, of, of bad internet law. Would it, a, a good way to describe it be to say it's like the ACLU, but for the internet? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a super good way of using it because we, we work with the ACLU quite a lot and uh, it's always good to kind of self-publicize each other. Okay, so this is obviously <laughs> an important job you guys are doing at a critical moment in history, and I want to hear more about it. But before we talk too much about the present, uh, I want to get a sense of who you are and how you got there. So the EFF started in 1990. How long have you been doing this? Holy cow. I feel kind of old. But, I mean, I was I was little in 1990. I don't think I even remember um, – I, I mean – in 1990, what was going on in the U.S. was really hard to find out. I'm from the U.K., as you might guess. Um, and so you'd really find out about what was going on in digital stuff. I, I know it sounds kind of ironic, but in zines. Sure. You know, um, uh, if you've ever been to Boing Boing, the website, um, Boing Boing started off as a zine. And I remember I would order it 
<laughs> in the mail and it would arrive and we would flick excitedly f- to find out what our cyber future was. Um, so I was doing this kind of stuff in the, in, in the UK. And uh, I mean, the big thing in the 90s was, um, have you heard of the crypto wars? It's kind of like the Clone Wars. But, no, but, no. But, what what no, are the okay. crypto wars? So the crypto wars was this thing in the 90s. Like everything you use these days uses encryption, right? It protects your credit card transactions. If you go to a website, HTTPS, all of that good stuff. Um, in the 90s, the US was extremely worried that that uh, encryption would stop the NSA from being able to monitor people's communications. And so what they tried to do was uh, have encryption declared as a export controlled weapon. They actually, it was actually sort of technically dis- dis- described as a munition. Um, Just like encryption software. Yeah, right. So actually, uh, encryption software is not terribly hard. I could write down in like four lines of code how to how to protect your communications from someone being spying on them, including the government. Strong encryption is super strong. Um, so this was this re- ended up in this ridiculous situation where if you cross the border theoretically with a four line piece of code or told someone in another country how to do this thing, um, you would be breaking the U.S. law. So this was something that the EFF for for many years and actually kind of won a key case to to stop it. Um, But on the other side, in the U.K., this was super ridiculous as well, and the government was trying to put controls there too. So there was a bunch of kind of ragtag... um, uh, nerd activists there and that's that's where i kind of sat and did this kind of in my spare time now first of all just to, just to wrap that up that never happened right like encryption what, how did that uh, encryption is obviously legal so how did it uh how, how did, did it pay yeah, out? How, how did so, you guys do that <laughs> so we went to the courts um and it was getting ridiculous so basically people are having tattoos of those four lines um, uh, put on their arms. I kind of remember, I'm a little younger than you, but I kind of remember this when um, CS, what was the DVD encryption DCC, scheme? DCSS had a similar kind of right, thing. Like right, 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 right. This was, from, from, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I interrupted your obscure technology story for like an, an, uh, another uh, obscure technology story. It's a great way. I often find the good way of explaining these things is by explaining them using even more obscure technology. And then eventually people just give up listening to you. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> the the it, it, but it all boils down to the same thing, which is um, an attempt to control something because it seems like a dangerous idea. But we're in an era where you really can't control ideas, and it's against the First Amendment. Um, I, expressing ideas is free speech within the United States, and that's what we did. We basically went to the courts and said, "Look, this is code. Um, you may not recognize what." Code is, um, but here's some examples. And code is speech. It's expressive speech. It's a way of conveying an idea. And and, and one of the the, the sort of uh, ways we did that was we actually there was a piece of software you might have heard of called Pretty Good Privacy (PGP). Sure, people still use it today, I believe. Right. And um, the guy who wrote PGP was being investigated because it had strong encryption, and he was suspected of quotes exporting unquotes the software by putting it up on a web uh, on the equivalent of a website, and then of course people could download it from wherever. Uh, and uh, uh, the way people would get around that was they would print out the entire source code to PGP into a book, and they would bind it as a hard back book and then export the book and then somebody on the other side would type it all back in again uh and we were able to go to the courts and go look this is a book banning books is not something the u.s government um should have any interest in doing and uh and that that argument sort of uh, and and some political pressure kind of saved the day um and it, it, it fits really the pattern of of what we try to do we tried to take something that governments and courts and everybody understands they have the right to do now in the, in the non internet part of the world and say, look, it's just the same online. We, we have to protect those rights there too. So when you were 
were you a lawyer before all this started? When you said like, no, I'm not a lawyer. So I should when say, you say you're like you're arguing say, and you're, you're you're making these cases, like what are you what are you doing exactly? What do I do? I sit in the back going rah rah rah. That sounds great. <laughs> um, so my back, I mean, my background weirdly is in um, uh, script writing, and I mean, not even Python script writing. I used to uh, write for TV in the UK and do comedy, um, uh, but um, but the. What what I'm part of really is part of the activist wing of the of the EFF, um, and uh, we try and explain this stuff and propagate this stuff out and get people talking about it. Um, and so mostly, what I spend my days doing is desperately trying to understand the next thing that's coming down the pike and work out how we could possibly describe this to someone else. You know, earlier you mentioned that free speech was sort of, uh, and the First Amendment was sort of one of the ways that you were able to ultimately make encryption legal. Uh, in the UK and globally, like, you obviously don't have the First Amendment. Like, what is the equivalent of the First Amendment, if there is one? Or is there is there one? Yeah, sure. There's Article 19 of um, uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. So um, uh, the the uh, there are human rights uh, principles that sort of echo uh, the First Amendment. And also, really, I mean, going back to this idea that technology changes or can, can, uh, and can enhance um, human rights, the, the, the truth is, and I have discussions with people all the time, I mean, before the internet came around, even if you had a sort of theoretical absolute free speech right within the United States, there were so many ways of preventing somebody from saying something. Uh, the only people who really had that kind of right old line is that, you know, the freedom of the press really only applies to people who actually have a printing press. And uh, and suddenly, after when the the internet emerged, everybody had a printing press, and everybody had this capability. So uh, I think that 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 the biggest way that people have learned to defend their right to speak freely has come from their understanding that this is a right that they can exercise right now, and it's going to take somebody actually taking it away from them to uh, to stop them. You've, you've got an internet connection. You can put up a website. People can see that website from all around the world. And somebody has to stop you or stop the internet or stop your web host from having that power. And that's, I think, how rights start. It's, it's something that you recognize everybody should have and everybody can have unless somebody gets in the way. I love talking like Wild West, early internet. Do you, do you have <laughs> an earliest internet memory, like the, the first time that you were really wowed by the internet? I totally do. So I was at university in 1989, and the internet wasn't really very pervasive in the UK at all. Um, I think there was sort of one satellite link connecting the universities together. And um, uh uh, it wasn't easy to get onto, um, but I managed to get onto it. Uh, and the, I think I was mainly interacting with, with Usenet. Should I explain Usenet? I yeah, think I, I think you probably should. should. Um, so Usenet was actually really forward thinking. We haven't really managed to successfully replace it. It was kind of a, 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 a forum system. It was pre-web, but it was super decentralized. So um, uh, there was no kind of host. There was no nobody running it. It just would propagate messages all around um, the early internet. And it quickly exploded. It would have these Usenet groups, and um, uh, uh, some of them were very sort of straightforward, like there were ones devoted to computer languages. And um, uh, But then there was this out network, out dot, um, which actually was started and defended by John Gilmore, one of our founders. And the argument there was we should let any topic under the sun be discussed on the Internet, which was, again, an early kind of victory because back then the Internet was primarily academic and people were making a lot of arguments that you, you really shouldn't be talking about, you know, fripperies like science fiction or politics on on this this wait this a minute there was a time on the internet when people said you shouldn't be talking about science fiction on the internet well i it was it was a really it was a really explosive thing that's because so, people of everything talk, we've discussed so far that's the hardest to imagine th there was a sci-fi mailing list a spread on the internet and people like this is a, this is a waste of time 
uh, early recognition of the rest of the internet uh, and uh, and this is a, this is an academic network we should be devoting to more serious topics um, anyway um, that of course was what I spent all my time like exploring and investigating and I remember coming out of a, a night sort of staying up all night trying to trying to just sort of engulf and read everything because there was this sort of feeling you could read everything even though even then you really couldn't and I stepped outside and the um, shop just next to my uh, university entrance was a Chinese um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, they sold vases, things like that. And they had a sign up saying that they were shut and it was because the Tiananmen Square protests had just been um, ruthlessly put down by the Chinese government. And during those days after that, when people were trying to get information out about what had happened to, in Tiananmen Square, both to the rest of the world and to within China, uh, and everybody was desperately trying to fax things. I remember fax machines were the way that people were trying to get information around. And I just remember looking at these two things and going, wow, something's going to change here. Um, and it's not when we're not just going to be talking about trivialities on the internet, we're going to be using that power to actually change states and change how, how power works. Don't touch that dial. There's more Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show right after this. And now a word from our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace, uh, if you somehow haven't heard, is the easiest way to make a great website. They have beautiful, award-winning templates uh, and an all-in-one platform. So whatever it is you want to do, you want to get your writing out there, uh, you want to sell something, maybe you have some art and you want to make a little portfolio website. Those are just three ideas off the top of my head. Anything you want to do with a website, which for now you you can do anything with a website. We'll we'll get back to Danny and see how long that'll last. But for now you can do anything with a website. So I say do it. Do it while you can. Do it with Squarespace. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com and enter code Jeff Rubin for ten percent off your first purchase. That is squarespace.com. Offer code Jeff Rubin. All right, back to the show. Let us turn our attention now uh, to the present. Uh, I think it's fair to say, like, most people listening to the show uh, love the Internet. Just love it. Like me, <laughs> I, you know. Uh, I think everyone loves the Internet, but I think the audience I, – I, I like to think I have an audience uh, who is more engaged than most. So I guess what I want the, – the thing I think we all need to know from you that we all need to understand today uh, is, like, what are, what are the threats to the Internet we know and love today – that we, the internet-loving audience, should be aware of? And I guess, what, like, what is keeping you up at night right now? That's a really good question, I think, because it's a lot of things are happening um, very quickly right now. I mean, there's been a change of administration uh, in the United States. and uh, I don't really follow politics. Who won yeah, the election? I don't know. I, I don't quite remember like who's who in politics, but I think there's this 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 Trump fellow, um, and and that 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 means that 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 we're in a real time of flux right now. And so what happens at the the EFF when this happens is we sort of we sort of switch into this very fast moving mode. Like we have like long term things. So. Again, something I should have said earlier, maybe one of the things people might know the EFF from is we've been suing AT&T and the government over the NSA surveillance programs for a very long time, um, since 2007, when we had a, a, a whistleblower, Mark Klein, sort of in the mold of Ed Snowden. Uh, and that's always something that's been in the back of our mind, well, in the forefront of our minds, that the expansion of those those surveillance programs. I work on the international side, and the NSA does an incredible amount of spying and monitoring and collecting of information uh, to the rest of the world. But sometimes it turns its um, its 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 Sauron like eyes um, <laughs> into the domestic United States. And one of the things that we're really concerned about right now is that how that surveillance program is going to be turned on on uh, average everyday Americans. So uh, what we watch out for is changes in the law, but changes in practice too. Um, 
And we're trying to shore up the internet to protect people against that. Uh, we help run a thing called Let's Encrypt, which means that people could turn on websites and make them super encrypted. Uh, and we uh, create uh, browser plugins uh, like uh, HTTPS Everywhere. And then we have one called Privacy Badger, which you can get if you go to EFF.org. They're all free. Um, and they're designed to kind of shore up your protections against that kind of government surveillance. Now, let me ask you, just to play devil's advocate here, I don't mm-hmm. do anything illegal. I'm not a terrorist. I want the government to catch the terrorists. Why is this? What's why is this such a bad thing? This is maybe it's good. Maybe the, the government should be. Maybe this is a price. Maybe it's okay if the government monitors all my communications if uh, it means they're going to catch people. What's wrong? What's so wrong with that? So there's a there's a few parts to this. Um, the first one is is that you know, the important thing here is this is mass surveillance. So this is collecting everybody's information and storing it semi-permanently um, so that anyone within government can search it and find out what anybody not is saying right now, but has said in the past. And so a good way of thinking about when you, this. When we talk about communications, we're talking email, uh, social media, text, phone calls, all the above. Yeah, pu- pu- public and private. So, um, uh, in the as outside of the U.S., um, there's a lot of interception of just everything: content of emails, content of phone calls. Within the U.S., there are programs that skirt super close to that by collecting all of the metadata of um, of your communications and also kind of storing other things too. So yeah, it's it's pretty much everything. And remember that like this isn't just stuff you say to other people. I think one of the things I try to convey to people is that you may think what gets stored is you chatting to people and that's all innocent you know you're not sitting there going and then we'll set the bomb off at 3 p.m or whatever but think of all the things that you just type into google on your own like uh you know i i use i use uh, um search engines to find out about like illnesses that I, you know, maybe I, I, I feel sick and I'm looking to find out what I have and I haven't discussed that with my family or something else that's incredibly private that I wouldn't even share with someone else. Well, that all goes in the hopper too. Um, so it's not just things that you're publicly talking about. It's these, these are other sides of really your intimate personality and of course, everywhere you go as well, that's metadata. So your phone is constantly announcing every movement you make. And and I mean, we really, ever since we began, have thought of a lot of technology as kind of an expansion of your 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 internal thoughts. It's and if you can get access and control to that, then really you you I mean, this is what advertisers want, right? Is that 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 you can begin to predict what you're thinking and understand what you're you're even considering, your in, your internal conscience. So so put that to one side though. Because it's collecting everyone, you you, you, you may think yourself as as not really someone who who is going to get targeted by this. But think of all the people that you kind of depend on in the world to speak up against power or authority. Or, um, you know, maybe have enemies of themselves who would want to destroy them. And it doesn't matter your politics, right? Everybody has someone who's fought for their rights or is fighting for their rights right now. Well, think what the what could be done to them. We just celebrated uh, Martin Luther King Day. And of course, Martin Luther King was spied on by the FBI. They would send threatening letters. They would try and like shut him down. And imagine a new MLK or whatever hero that you have and the fact that they will have everything that they've ever said or effectively thought. Um, you can construct a case against anyone based on, 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 on that kind of uh, information. And think of what the chilling effect that has on you. Supposing it comes a day comes what, where can you, you... Can you quickly define what a chilling effect is? Because I feel like that's uh, thrown... Oh, we, we unfortunately live in an era where it's been th- being thrown out a lot. So I know. Let's, it's, let's make it's, sure it's, everyone understands. I'm used to like explaining technical things, and I realize I'm now picking up these legal constitutional terms. Uh, and So a chilling effect is is when um, it's the censorship that occurs through self-censorship, 
where um, no one's sitting there like stopping you from saying something, but you know everything is being monitored and you know that there might be consequences for you speaking up. So you don't say anything at all. And so we say that your speech has been chilled. Um, it's interesting that uh, uh, Penn, um, the um, writer's group, did a survey of writers and journalists after the Snowden revelations that came out. And all of them described how they just tread a little bit more carefully now about what they say and do on the Internet, because they never know when this information might be used against them. And that's a chilling effect. You know, going back in the past, people used to speak incredibly freely on the Internet. Um, and now that's kind of going away and people think once or twice before what they say and what they do. And that's, 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 that's a bad reaction. And it's something that we might not even be aware of. And that affects everyone, not just our, our heroes or, or, you know, the people that we, we expect to fight for on our behalf. All right. So we got mass government surveillance to deal with. What else is on your list? Um, so a lot, there's been a big fight over net neutrality in the last few years, and um, net neutrality is kind of interesting in the, the pantheon of things that people fight for to protect the internet, because it actually kind of requires uh, regulation. It requires the government to kind of step in. Uh, generally speaking, we're, we're a bit skeptical of regulation, but this was one of those situations where um, uh, uh, trying to sort of keep the market from working, keep the market working correctly was the 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 aim of it well um the new the new trump administration is really not that friendly (laughs) to net neutrality um we don't quite know what will happen in the next four years but um the the people have been put in charge of the regulators like the fcc who would normally govern and decide these things are actually very specifically against net neutrality and And what is net neutrality i mean I sort of have a sense of what it is, but since we're talking about it, let's make sure we're all on the same page. What's well, neutrality? It's, it, the idea is, is it's um, you don't want to have um, uh, fast lanes on the internet that people pay for to get you information. Like when you buy your internet connection, you know, you buy twenty megabits a second, hundred megabits a second, and you expect to get everything. Um, coming to you as fast as possible. The risk is is that um, you're getting that from one internet provider, and they may turn to all the people that you connect to and say, hey, if you give us some money, we'll get this information to um, uh, our customer faster than other websites. And this kind of breaks the thing I talked about earlier, which is like everybody is kind of equal on the internet and the innovation can come from anywhere. Um, and so if uh, um, uh, the, they allow, say, one company to get you video super quickly and another company to um, get their video kind of slowed down, uh, that means you can build monopolies and you can you can stop people from speaking. So that's what it is. You know, I want to do the same thing I did last time where I present the other side of the argument and then, you know, ask you to explain yeah. why that's not uh, the case. But this is one where I'm actually having trouble even imagining what the hypothetical other side <laughs> of the argument is. Why is this even controversial? Like, what uh, – th- these people that wa- – that – don't want net neutrality. Net neutrality is good. We want net neutrality. These people that don't want it, uh, what is like? I mean, I, I, I imagine there's a profit motive for at least some of these people. But what are they? What are they saying out loud? What is the stated reasoning behind it? Okay, so what I'm going to do because I always feel a little uncomfortable giving the other sides like argument and then letting them win. Um, I'm go- <laughs> I'm going to give the the counter argument and then I'm going to give brilliant response to it that will convince anybody who has that So position. I need the counter-argument um, and the counter-counter-argument the counter, on exactly. the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin so show. So I think the counter-argument first is people are super suspicious of, of, of regulation and I think that's understandable, right? You put a, um, a government department in charge of the internet and pretty soon they're making all kinds of other demands. And the nice thing about the internet right now is there isn't some department of internet 
doing that. Um, so this would be a dangerous first step and a slippery slope. The other argument is, uh, well, maybe the free market can kind of fix this problem, right? If you are using connecting to an internet service provider and like one side is super fast and another side is really slow, you're going to like look at it and go, this, this internet connection sucks. I'm going to go and, and, and buy a connection from, from someone else. Um, the, 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 the problem here is that, that, most people really don't have a huge selection of internet providers. Like most people in the United States have like, maybe if they're lucky, they have a cable provider and a DSL provider. They have a phone company and a cable company, but a lot of people only have one of those. And so there really isn't that much competition in this space to prevent this from happening. Um, I've also read kind of papers that are super fascinating, but I won't bore you with discussing how this might be an example of a market failure. This might be an example of something where the government does have to kind of step in. What would be another example of a market failure, just so I can contextualize that? Well, another natural monopoly, like um, supposing um, somebody has uh, control of the um, water supply in your neighborhood and um, and is selling you water for a hundred dollars a cup, right? Like if they control all the water in an area, then um, no one's going to be able to compete with, with, with that, that seller. Um, so it's kind of like that. It means that it's really hard to get a variety of choices about your internet connection. So the counter argument is that, yeah, maybe, maybe the market might be able to solve this, but we really don't have a free market in last mile uh, internet connectivity. And so we're, users aren't able to vote with their feet and go, this internet sucks, we're going we're gonna to switch to this other one. Is there ever a chance of like another internet provider company, like a startup internet provider? Is that a thing? I don't understand. As much as I love the internet, I don't understand how it works. Is there a chance that might ever happen? <laughs> well, we used to have it. This is what this is another thing that's sort of interesting. In the early days of the internet, you would have you would dial up on a phone. And um, you had a, a, a really big choice of internet providers because you could switch between them as easily as dialing another phone number. Um, the problem with the modern internet is that it's not really anything to do with the technology. It's to do with like how it gets to you. Like that um, it either comes in a telephone wire or um, a TV cable um, connection um, or occasionally wireless. Like, so there are wireless internet providers and, uh, and you, you set up a little dish. Um, so things may change, right? This is the other thing that you have to bear in mind when you're dealing with, particularly with regulation, is that um, uh, technology is always changing and um, there might be a possibility of solving this, this problem with technology. One of the things that we spend a lot of time working on is how to encourage um, community networks to emerge, right? Where people, rather than depending on a big telephone company, uh, can create a, 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 a local internet of their own, which they then just pay to have a, 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 a connection into the, into the heart of the internet, which is what your phone company really does, right? They connect you in what's called the last mile, and then they reach out into kind of the, the, the backbone of the internet and do a deal to connect with the wider thing. Well, you, you, you can have a bunch of people who could get together and do that, um, but there are legal imp regulatory impediments um, preventing people from do that, doing that. And we would like to improve that and get, get rid of those. Uh, the other thing is, is research that, that companies like um, uh, Facebook and Google and um, Elon Tesla is also looking into it to have um, either very low orbit satellites um, give um, cover the world in internet connectivity or even sort of blimps that would float semi-permanently and would be solar powered and would uh, uh, um, convey the internet down this last mile um, to everyone. I've been saying for a long time, solar powered blimps are the solution to all our problems. I know, right? Like I, I, I remember Zeppelins, I think, and possibly make a comeback in this. But I, I love that kind of idea of solving, yeah, uh, solving a political problem with technology. Um, 
And, and that's kind of at our heart what we, we think about. We're just trying to make room and allow people to come up with innovative solutions um, so that, that we, can, we can fix any problems that we, we see coming up. Uh, you mentioned the last mile, and I've heard that term, and I think I understand what it is. That's like the piece, that, you know, the, that's the internet provider connecting you to that whole amorphous blob of the internet. But right. that amorphous blob of the internet, you just mentioned how there's like no department of internet. And the internet seems, uh, I mean, my, it seems like, I mean, there's no one running it, right? Like there's, there's actually like no one managing it. It's just like a bunch of people who have agreed to sort of get their computers to cooperate. Right? Am I? Am I? Is that a yeah? Fair I mean, it's, I mean, at the highest level, that's totally true. I mean, there's a little. There are a few places where the internet gets kind of the 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 theory of the internet gets kind of centralized. But 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 yeah, that's basically true. I guess my question then is like, uh, when you talk about governments in, enacting policies that could spoil the internet. Uh, and how does that affect the global community on the internet? And you mentioned how like uh, America. How we export garbage internet policies, and that does that ruin it for everyone else? Do they then latch on to our policies, or then do they have to follow them because so much internet traffic runs through America? I think you've described it really well. So, in the big the big issue um, of the last sort of fifteen years uh, over this has been copyright, and um, the uh, the U.S. has a really big. Um, uh, entertainment industry that has a lot of vested interest in maximizing um, the amount of money it gets through through uh, uh, copyrighted material, and very early on in the internet, they managed to introduce um, uh, uh, legislation that was an attempt to to prevent the internet um, affecting that business model. Uh, one of the things that you may have heard of is the is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. And the DMCA uh, has this clause that lets people take down content just by sending a, um, a, a notice to uh, a company, somebody hosting um, uh, anything online. And basically, all you have to do is say, I pinky swear that this is, uh, I have the copyright in this picture or movie or whatever, and now you have to take it down. And this, ha- this is really not good because it's sort of this end run around the normal judicial system of how you would get somebody to self-censor or, or, or remove content. Uh, and that's been exported around the world. And also, exactly as you've said, like all of these U.S. companies sort of say, well, we have to comply with the DMCA. And so all of these people in other com- countries that don't have the DMCA end up facing the same problems. All of these problems we're talking about, uh, the NSA, net neutrality, like I guess we don't know because there's a new administration, but h- how – I don't know. How uh, – is there an end to the tunnel in sight, or is this just like a lifelong battle we're going to be fighting? Well, I mean, these things are. I mean, if fighting for your your civil liberties is, is, is always an ongoing thing. You know, the the price of of, <laughs> of, of freedom of eternal vigilance. So, yeah, I mean, you always have to keep going. But there are there are swings and roundabouts. I guess I, it feels like because it's the internet and because it's all so new. And if, what you just said is like, of course, true. And I, I just hadn't thought about. If that's true for analog civil liberties, of course, it's true for digital civil liberties, true. But because the Internet is so new, it feels like maybe we're just a few decisions away from, like, getting it into a place where we're going to be great. But what you just said made me realize <laughs> that, like, no, of course that's not true. And just, like, free speech in real life, like, it's uh, it's going to be a lifelong battle for all of us. Well, I think I think that it goes either way, right? The, 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 the beauty of the Internet and the beauty of new technology is it's so protean. It so could change... One day to the next. And and that means that you can, you know, push something past the di- would be dictators of the world, right? That you can you can they can suddenly find themselves in a situation where they were trying to stop and censor everybody in their country from being able to speak. And this internet thing comes in and like changes everything. But it works the other way too. And if you don't if you don't walk around with your eyes open, you can suddenly find that something that you were you took for granted is taken away with you in a, a, a matter of, you know, months. 
Um, so that's what we spend a lot of trying to do. Was we, we spend a lot of time at EFF trying to anticipate what's coming on down the pike and then trying to um, get ahead of it. So, I mean, to give you an example, like, you know, lots of people talk and interest about 3D printers, but it's going to be a while before 3D printing becomes a real the huge thing. You know, the 3D printers where you can you can plug in a design into a computer and it will sit there kind of a, a knit together an actual object like yeah. you could you the could one i always use it. when i'm trying to explain to people is like oh it's kind of like wiffle ball bat material or at least the ones i've used i've seen right. are kind of like that imagine like printing a wiffle ball bat they're they're much right. smaller now but that's sort of what we're talking about right uh, but you know the con the, the the what the range of things that you will be able to make with those things is going to widen out you mean it's not uh, just going to uh, be wiffle ball bats <laughs> in they're the thinking future, bigger they're thinking bigger no in the future, everything we wear will be made from wiffle ball bats, and uh, we'll be able to eat wiffle ball bats. It's like plastic. Um, so, uh, uh, wait, so- are we really going to be able to eat it, like Star Trek replicator style? <laughs> well, of course, that's the end game, right? The uh, the, the thing so. that people get excited about three D printers is they're kind of like replicators in the sense that you have like this this menu of of things that you can make and it's just a matter of picking the thing that you 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 want to do anyway three i got you off track talking about wiffle ball bats the point is that 3d printers are coming they're gonna make big stuff but the flip side of this is that that's gonna make a lot of people unhappy like the point where you go oh i don't really need to buy a replacement cover for my phone because i can just print one out or you know actually like i really liked that 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 fancy glass design for a necklace but i'm just going to print it myself rather than buy it from that person and it gets like um file sharing was in the early 2000s where like lots of people are going to freak out because it's going to be really easy to copy stuff and the question you end up there is like well do we need to build stuff into 3d printers to act as kind of a policeman that says i'm afraid you're printing something that someone once patented um or do we allow people to print whatever they want and um, and 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 see the benefits of effectively uh, allowing people to create in their own houses something that they've depended on a whole infrastructure to do before. So, I mean, that's not happening now. Just so you know, I'm not going to ask for like you to call your senators about this, but. We're, we're trying to anticipate what happens in the future so we can start doing court cases and we can start writing up um, what's going to happen. Um, same thing goes for um, uh, artificial intelligence, actually. That's the other. Like, We see a lot of other things going on in machine learning and computers are getting smarter in that way. Well, how do we prevent algorithms and artificial intelligence from affecting human civil liberties and human rights? And we spend a bit of time thinking about that in a copious spare time. <laughs> and what, what is, I mean, what is the position on that? Is it, are androids people from the EFF's perspective? Is data a person? I can well imagine if we were going to have that discussion in a court, um, EFF's lawyers would be involved. And which side would we be on? That androids are people, right? Hey, and we have a soft spot for 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 androids. Why hey, is that? Probably. Like that seems so different. I'm on board just because I like Star Trek. So I'm like, yeah, Data's a person. He's cool. Right. But uh, I've seen that episode. Like you know, <laughs> right? Riker completely lost. Right? I think we, 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 we won there. But that seems very different than the other issues we've been talking about. I guess because the other issues are related to human civil liberties. Why are androids people? Why do you suspect if that would be the side of the case that the EFF would be on? Um. I think because we we want people to be empowered by the future. We want people to have all of the capabilities that technology it gives them. And um, if we, I, I, I just I, I just kind of feel that like the the the. I mean, this isn't me speaking. Uh, you know, uh, uh, as the FF uh, official spokesman, but you know. We want to expand rights to everyone, everyone, and um, and Andrew, I think Android's are probably people too. I think we'd support that. Don't touch that dial. There's more Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show right after this. 
I got one more sponsor for you this afternoon, and it's a fun one. It is Blue Apron. And let me tell you why this is an especially fun one for me. Uh, if you listen to this show, and if you specifically listen to the episode about uh, Zoom Pizza, a.k.a. the Robot Pizzeria uh, that I put out at the end of last year, uh, that episode, we actually paused for a moment to discuss what a terrible cook I am. And my guest on that episode uh, asked why I'm a bad cook. And I explained that uh, I could probably follow directions, um, but I just never really learned how to cook, and I don't have a lot of interest in that. But I, I, in that episode, state emphatically that I could probably follow directions. And thanks to Blue Apron, I have finally put that to the test. I ordered Blue Apron. I prepared, I'm not making this up, roasted cauliflower steaks with curried bok choy and black rice. And let me tell you, if I am able to do this, I swear you can do it. Uh, and even better, you can find out, you can test my theory, uh, you can try it for free. Just go to blueapron.com slash Ruben, R-U-B-I-N, that's blueapron.com slash Ruben, and you will get your first three meals free with free shipping. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait, that is blueapron.com slash Ruben. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. All right, let's finish the show. Now, this is the, the biggest question of the day. Uh, I am very terrified at the moment, and I mean, I'm afraid. I'm afraid for everyone. I'm afraid for uh, women and LGBT people and anyone that lives near an ocean. But the this internet thing possibly scares me the most because I worry that if we don't have a free and open internet. We won't be able to get like started, and we won't be able to even organize around those other issues. So to me, this is the big source issue from which all of these other issues flow. Yeah. I, 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 I think that's right. I think that I've had a lot of discussions with people, um, and I mean, it's great in the U.S. right now because people are having this really like complicated – it's great in the um, U.S. right now is not a sentiment I've heard a lot lately, but keep well, going. Well, <laughs> I, I, you know, maybe maybe I'm I'm maybe I'm always someone who sees it as optimistic, but but people are so engaged in what's happening. Like people have suddenly like woken up and gone, wait, like politics isn't boring. Politics is potentially extremely dangerous. Yes, and, that's true. Um, I, I guess I would uh, say there, there's re there's certainly, and especially as we're recording this, um, the women's march was yesterday. There, there's many reasons right. to be optimistic in the U.S. I wouldn't go that far, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that it's 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 good to see this sort of happening. And like yes, one yes. of the things that you you know, as someone who fights for for internet rights, like. It seems sometimes like there are a million other things that 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 are happening right now all around the world um, that seem a little more in your face than internet civil liberties. Um, but I think you've put your finger on it that the reason why I keep working in this area is because I think that that whatever anybody does um, – politically or to improve society or, or to undermine it, they'll have to use the internet to do it. Um, the internet will be part of that equation and we need to freeze into um, the technology that we have, the civil liberties that we want to protect. And if we don't do that, that'll be one of the first things to go. So I, I agree. I know there's listeners who are listening right now that agree. How can we help? Gosh, well, there's uh, and there's there's actually lots of ways you can help, and I just encourage people to go to our website www.eff.org. We got an early one, um, and also act.eff.org, and that will give you a list of things you can do. We're actually in the middle of a hundred day plan with this new administration going through, and you'll be able to go to our blog and see all the things we can do. I also am a great advocate of people taking some protection and teaching other people about how to protect themselves. We run a website called Surveillance Self-Defense, and that encourages people to teach others how to use tools like Signal or, um, uh, or Tor, um, how to lock down their computers so that they're safer from government and, frankly, you know, criminal intrusion too. And that makes people more confident about using computers and it empowers them. Um, so go to ssd.eff.org and learn about how you can teach other people. And finally, you know, people are busy. 
and um and the best way of of um uh, being able to very quickly empower us is is brutally give us some money <laughs> um we're we're pretty much dependent on individual donations we're um we're a membership run organization and uh, a huge chunk of our over a third of our um, money comes from uh, individual donors, and it's pretty easy to sign up, and it doesn't really take much. So, so let's say, and I, I don't know that we have. <laughs> we're usually more concerned with like Pog champions from the '90s, so I don't know that we have a lot of charitable individuals on this podcast. So I don't have a chance to ask this question. I cut you guys a check for fifty dollars. Let's say, where does that money go? How does it help? What does it actually do? Like, help me, help me, help me imagine how my fifty dollars is going to make the internet well, better. Ten bucks goes on my sandwiches. <laughs> uh, so, so it all goes to the program. I mean, we get the top stars and Charity Navigator and things like this. Sure. I, I guess the the two things that 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 uh, people don't quite know about EFF is one that all goes on people who, uh, well, almost all of it, like a huge percentage, much more than a lot of charities, goes on people like me who work every day to do this. It, very little of it goes on, you know, underlying costs or, or, or getting more money from other people. The other thing is we're actually a pretty small organization. We're really, um, uh, we're bigger now than we used to be. When I first started, there was just like 20, 30 of us in a little basement. Um, and we're about 70 people now. So, um, but we, we have one office in San Francisco. And if you ever go and look on tech news sites and things like that and you see the EFF has done this and the EFF has done that you kind of assume that like we're really big uh we're not but we work exclusively in this area which means that people like you people like your audience are the only people who really understand why what we're doing and why it's important so there's sort of an extra an extra um a benefit from 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 you giving us money because you'll understand what we're doing, and um, and you'll be able to tell us if we're doing it wrong. Um, but 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 you're you're speaking for a bunch of all the people that you know who don't really understand about technology and don't really know about internet censorship, but benefit from protecting those civil liberties. I love uh, that answer. That is a great answer. And you know, it's it's when you think back. Uh, to the encryption wars, to, to the, the great encryption wars, this is winnable. Like the, you know, um, these these are, yep. Like this, this there can be a happy ending here. Like we, this is, uh, this is something. You, it's think been of, done in the past, and it can be done again. Right. Think of think of the crypto wars. Think of SOPA. Think of net neutrality. These are all things where you know when I was talking to people, the world was divided between people going. I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. And people going, you absolutely have to do this. You have to like, uh, like everything will be screwed unless you do this. And like slowly the proportions change over time. Um, and I just feel like, you know, there's such a tiny fraction of the internet community who have an inkling about how important it is or how it works or why it's important. And I guess those people are on the on the vanguard. You guys have to um, um, uh, step up sometimes. Yes, I think we do. Well, thank you. I mean, you guys truly fighting the good fight, not just for us, but for the world. Are there countries that have sensible Internet laws? Like, is there a country that is a model of reasonable Internet governance that we sh- we could follow that we could look up to? It's it's scattered actually. Pretty pretty much um, uh, every country has like one really good law that would be fantastic if everybody else has. Like what's like, one of those? Uh, um, like Chile has a really good net neutrality law, and Brazil has this Internet Bill of Rights, which is awesome. And the Philippines actually has a pretty good one. Um, uh, the U.S. is copyright law is actually kind of good in a lot of places. Like we have fair use that are a lot of places um, don't. Um, Sweden has some pretty good free speech laws. Iceland has the Pirate Party, and they're doing pretty well putting some some stuff through. The European Union has some great data protection um, uh, principles, um, and Canada has this alternative to the DMCA, which is really smart and clever and great and um uh, and so again that kind of gives me hope right like the 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 the, the 
William Gibson said that, you know, the future is here, but it's, um, it's just not very well distributed. And I think my optimism for the internet is also here, but it's, it's very well distributed <laughs> across a lot of smart people in a lot of different countries. <laughs> you know, it's, it just occurred to me, you live in the U.S. now, you're from the U.K., I don't know how clear this is based on my question, is there free speech in the UK? But I don't know a lot about laws. Basically, I barely understand anything in the US. Forget international (laughs) laws. Did you have difficulty learning? Because you you, you, were learning just sort of the nuances of American law and how a law is made in America and who how Um, to be an activist in America. The thing I say to Americans when they ask me that is like the whole of the rest of the world knows how the US works, oh, right? Because man, it's, it's in every like TV show. I mean, we may have a slightly warped idea about like what the courts consist of people going, objection, objection sustained. Damn it, lawyer, you're got to do that. Anyway, it's not quite like that. I've been to a few court cases now, but like I have a far better understanding and most people do of like the US Constitution than than an American would have of what's going on in the UK. And that's fine. It's not because you're like terrible rednecks or anything like that. It's just that you're not watching like, you know, court serials from the UK. You know about how cakes are baked in Britain. You just don't know how the, the legal system works. I, there's a um, lot of wigs is my understanding. There is, actually. <laughs> that's basically all I know about it is that there there's some funny wigs. Uh, right, right. Um, so, so that wasn't a problem. You don't have to know just like what the court system's like. Your job is like moving the laws, you know, like or helping to move the laws and understanding like real nuance about them, right? So my 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 first job at the EFF was that I was the only activist. We were super tiny then, and like I I was the activist, and I was sitting there encouraging people to like contact their representative and stuff like that, and I was sort of sitting there going. I'm telling everybody to do this, but I can't actually do this because I'm still on my green card, right? Like, I I mean, I was paying taxes and taxation without representation, but, like, it was kind of weird to go, I'm, I'm trying to, like, chivvy all of these people to do something that I myself can't do, which is vote. Um, but, uh, 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 but, you know, that's how, that's how it actually plays out. Like, you have to, like, again, like, if you're an American... What you do affects the rest of the world. So you really have to think about taking this stuff even more seriously if you weren't taking it seriously before. Right, right. Well, again, Danny, I want to thank you for uh, fighting the good fight here. Uh, it's, I, it's, I think it's really important. It's an issue that a lot of people don't understand, uh, not only don't understand how important it is, but just don't even understand that it really exists. Um, so I, I really appreciate uh, all the work you and the team over there is doing, and I would encourage uh, anyone listening uh, to you know go, go to the website, check it out, learn a little bit, and uh, if you can, if you can afford it, uh, give them some money because I think we're going to need these guys in the years ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. That is it for this week's episode of the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. Uh, Sort of a different episode, but I uh, really thought it was an important thing to talk about, and I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something, and I hope you will consider uh, supporting the EFF in the future. Thank you, as always, for listening. I will be back in two weeks. Until then, if you want to hang out, you can find me on Twitter, where I am at Jeff Rubin Show, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, on Tumblr, and of course at JeffRubinJeffRubin.com. Uh, we can get every episode of the show for free. I would love to hear suggestions for guests for future episodes, uh, and you can reach me at any of the places I just mentioned, and I also have an email address uh, publicly listed on that website I mentioned, JeffRubinJeffRubin.com. I'll see you there, and if not, I'll see you in two weeks. But until then, bye. That was a HeadGum Podcast.